Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Video Game Collectors Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Rose. That's Josh, or maybe it's this way, I don't know, it reverses on me sometimes. I'm right here. It's and me, Josh. Special guest today, Claire Shelton. Uh, Claire Shelton. Yeah. Claire Shelton. Welcome. Long time uh, closet listener, I'm hearing. Yeah, I, I have listened for at least three years now. Um, oh, shit. Wow. A long time. <laughs> Actually, but even before I worked for WADA, I had listened to uh, one of the Dan Gomez episodes, one of the very early ones. Yeah, he came in. He came in hot. That was early. He was yeah. uh, He was sharing like the modern warfare stuff and I was blown yeah. away. At, yeah. I also it. watched, I think, episode one with Dennis. Mm -hmm. I watched that one a, a long time ago at this point. Yeah, we had episode two that we took down because I was driving. Uh, oh, I I saw that one. I think before it was down. Yeah, yeah, it was bad. I don't, I don't know if it's down anymore. I'll have to go back and look. <laughs> no, Claire. If for people who don't know, Claire Sheldon is the uh, what is your title exactly? Uh, head of Wada is my head title. Yes. Okay, and um, we're here to talk to Claire about video games we got questions about water maybe we have questions about claire and her uh, journey from video game gaming collecting and to where she is today and um i think that's kind of what we're gonna cover we're not awesome. talking vhs vhs as well i yes. really thought that's what this was all about this is the vhs episode so i i have only prepared betamax so if i may have to step <laughs> out if <laughs> That's that's fine because I was really hoping we could talk select division as well. So oh, okay, perfect. Yeah. Or CED. Uh, we'll, we'll, CED. We can go to CED as well. Yeah, I do have a Pioneer Laser Active over here. I need to fire up eventually, but um, yeah. Anyways, well, welcome Claire to the show. This is thank you. Exciting. Glad to be here. Um, yeah, Matt, do you have any list of questions? Or I I, I mean, where where did collecting? I mean, I. I I always come in and I, I forget that a lot of our listeners don't know who you are, like, and maybe history or anything like that. And I, I I love to hear people's history. Like, how did you even get started in video games? What's your first memory of video games? Where did it all start for you? Um, like for you, where did, where did everything start? Yeah. Yeah. So, so video games and me um, do go a long way back. I can't remember the exact age. I think I was four or five. The The time eludes me, but um, we didn't have a console at that point in time. That would have been mid nineties. Um, and, and my dad had been a, a gamer as a, as a kid with, with various Atari consoles, but he never stepped into Nintendo after he like graduated and, and moved out. So Atari was kind of all he knew um, and some very early PC stuff. Um, so emulated Atari on our home PC was was actually my first exposure to gaming. And the very first game I ever played was Joust. Um, and I, I still hold an incredible fondness for, for Joust. I still think it holds up just as a game incredibly well. So the early ones for me were um, Joust, Dig Dug. Um, I always forget the name of it. Um, it's Chip. It's the game where he says bummer when he dies. It's like chip the this is a it's a PC game, not a non Atari game. Um bummer. It's bummer, man. No, I don't um, know. What was it? Uh Chips Challenge. That's what it's oh, called. You were a Chips Challenger. Yeah, I loved that game. Um Yeah. Did you know that was supposed to be made for the NES and it was never released and then they found a prototype and yeah. Yeah, there's a, I, I think I've seen a homebrew before version yeah. of it as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. So that... Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, you're good. Uh, um, but that, that was my actual first exposure to gaming. Uh, the very first console or, or any device that I owned uh, was a Game Boy Color that I got for my birthday with a copy of Pokemon Blue. Um, oh. So that, that was where my collecting and also like my personal ownership of gaming came into play. So did you start diving into the Pokemon world then and collecting the Pokemon games? And I, I did, yeah. I, I um, As a kid, I, I played pretty religiously through Gen 3, um, but then it became uncool. 
uh, and, and at least the social circles I was in. Um, and so then I fell out for, for a while. I think I dabbled back in, in gen five or six, um, you know, in private, of course, it's too uncool to, to talk about publicly, but, um, but yeah, I, I've dove back in as an adult into both the collecting and playing those games. Um, I like Pokemon a lot, but I'm not, um, I don't have as much of an affinity for it as I, as I kind of guessed that I would. And I think part of that is just how the games, like, um, I think the old games are still awesome, but the new games just um, always leave me disappointed for one reason or another. And, you know, a lot of that's to do with the switch and that hardware and how fast they pump those out. But um, I do love all the retro games and I do try and collect. Um, I have most of the, the series for the cardboard stuff. And then I have, um, I believe all games, including international for DS and 3DS for Pokemon, which is a lot more than you think. So do you, when you, when you collect, like say, let's go back to like Game Boy Advance yeah. uh, Pokemon or even Game Boy Pokemon, do you do CIB? I mean, like what's your, what's your preferred? Time? Yeah. Yeah, I do do CIB. Um, not for everything, for Pokemon. Yeah. CIB only. Okay. um that stuff can get pretty pricey but um i guess some of the newer stuff I, about half of what i have is sealed but um for yeah cardboard era definitely cib um i, I have like most of the analog consoles and the analog pocket is one of the, my favorite things ever created so um kind of what as i was reacquiring a lot of those cards it was like either to use on a modded game boy you know over the last seven eight years or once the analog pocket came out it was okay everything is for this this console got it and now, now as a i i always see you like you're head of wada but i see you as head of grading head of whatever yeah. Do you, are you just crazy particular about cib on when it comes to like your pokemon games like oh my gosh i need to upgrade this or this is trash or you yeah know, you know, it's it's actually funny. So, so you are correct that I do still um, run our grading room and, and head up our standards and whatnot. Um, however, I am extremely not picky when it comes to my personal collection. Um, I know that that's somewhat of a an anomaly, both within the scene and especially within my profession. But I think I think part of it is because I see so much high end material that's in excellent condition that I that I know how hard it is to achieve that. And, and I also see people who grade things that are not in as good of shape. And I think to some degree that has influenced me of like, hey, like, you know, collect what you love, collect in what you can acquire it for. And if I could get five complete in box games in average condition versus one super mint one, I take quantity over quality when it comes to my personal collection. Interesting. I think our all of our backgrounds illustrate that to, to an extent. I, I think that's good to hear. And I think that's good for listeners to hear as well. And and maybe even you just shedding the light that you get to see all the games coming in. So you get to see the, the highs and the lows and you get you get a better idea of what an average yeah. would be versus a lot of us, you know, maybe our perspective is jaded and thinking average is like nine, six, nine, eight, or, you know, nine, six is yeah. like, and in a lot of things that, that's not true that that's where you get your fix though you don't have to collect it because you see it every day so it yeah makes sense. yeah no that that is that is part of it i do get to appreciate it up close but matt yeah. you're totally right in that people's perspectives are skewed to some degree because of what exists and what gets sold or what gets posted mm -hmm. um like i think if i were to grade a lot of my cardboard cibs like you know would probably be like at best in the, in the eights um, which like is actually still decent. And, and like I, you know, as I've upgraded my collection throughout the years, you know, buying a new box and selling the old box, things like that to, to you know, keep it improving. I do care about that. But, um, you know, if you go on eBay and if you were to grade the, you know, the the 20 lowest price CIBs you find, like you're going to get stuff that that's just in horrific condition. But But that is like, what the average person who's maybe not thinking about grading, that's what they're acquiring. And, and that's what like, you know, they're happy getting in their collection. So I think that perspective is really healthy to have. I think it's totally normal too. I mean, being a collector for a long time, Matt's seen this, everybody goes through different progressions of collecting mm -hmm. and 
with me, it's, it's always been about just about everything, right? I, I'll collect super mint stuff. Um, and then I'll collect the, the weirdest Hong Kong pirated shit in the world. And it, it, to me, that stuff, I don't care what the condition is because it's just such an anomaly that I can pick it up. Um, and same with Sachin items. And, but the other stuff, it's like this NES game, the CIB, I've had hundreds of those over the years, thousands of them. Like if it's not to the, the, the quality standard that I want, it's, it's out the door. Right. So it's, it's easy to move certain things and other things it's not. So as, as you progress as a collector, things change, but also just getting what you love is, is a big deal. It's really important um, because everybody starts somewhere, even if you aren't a collector, you know, and they evolve over time. So. And obviously a platform, each platform has its variations, I feel, um, you know, versus what an average of that would be like an Atari to me, like we were talking earlier off camera, Atari average would be like seven, seven, five. Like that would be even maybe that would be nice. Yeah. yeah. That would even be a solid grade um, based on the factors versus a disc game where I can see a disc game you know, that maybe that constitutes like, you know, in the nines for an average or something like that. That makes sense because they don't really get damaged. It's not hard even there. even so, Matt, you, you would think that. But if you go to pick out a used game at a game store, 90 percent, 80, let's say 80 percent of the time that disc has been resurfaced. Yeah. Right. Like, do you want to resurface disc in your collection? If you're gaming, maybe not. But if you're collecting and you like got to catch them all and you are a little bit about condition disc stuff is deceit like it's it's very hard to find nice stuff i go to goodwill once a week to pick up stuff i rarely find anything mint like yeah. it's just it's impossible and every jewel case is always cracked like always always one at least yep yeah i, I got a question claire about yeah. a grading and it, because we're talking about condition and atari in particular when you grade an atari cib that had the glue flap i don't know if you've graded one yeah. and it's torn underneath but like it looks nice how hard does uh, something like that hit a grade yeah so when you say torn are, are you sitting where like where inevitably because it was opened part of the glue has you know usually the white on top of it yeah the, it'll have like a piece yeah. of the like if you tore this thing up here to open right. this this copy, yeah. it's gonna um, have late, leave damage to the box. I'm I'm yeah, curious so, how something like that is. There handled. there are slight penalties, but not in, in anywhere similar to where if you know, for example, on an NES game, there were equivalent size and severity tears in the same location. Sure. So we do take account, you know, in the case that something has been opened and and that damage was impossible to avoid if it was going to be open, we do take that into account. Okay. Yeah. I just, I haven't ever graded anything like that. And I had an Atari yeah. game here, stocking condition. And I, I think seven, five is very high for Atari. Actually. Yeah. I think the majority of it that exists out there is like in the five to six range. Yeah. Actually. If I had to place my bets, NES is definitely the lowest average, like worldwide supply. Really? NES, like just, if you, if you look on eBay, like the condition is just so terrible. So um, we're talking on CIB, average. CIB, so just average, that's in cartridges yeah, just CIBs, too. Yeah, yeah, cartridges are trash, like boxes, if they exist, you know, they're missing internal flaps, or they've got tears, or the hang tab is gone, or manuals are missing pages, or covers, or it, it, it's a mess. So I, I think, um, you know, even for NES, like you said, Josh, 7.5 is not that bad of a grade, all things considered. Yeah, mm -mm. That's a pretty well put together box, actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's what, when, when you, when, when you buy like an average collection of somebody that is say a set collector, you buy their stuff that, and they're like their goal at the time, if they were going for every NES game, you know, 800 plus with unlicensed things and variants, they, they would get the game. I got it. I collected it on the shelf onto the next one. They typically didn't go back from let's say like 19 collectors from 19, mid nineties up until early 2010 ish. Right. They, those collectors, they would get, they would set collect. And there was very, very few that were condition sensitive on looking at things. You get the game, put it away. Got it. Maybe I'll upgrade that Jetson's manual eventually. Right. That is stapled in weird spots, but 
that when you would buy a collection, I would say averages on the on the sets would be like six five to eight oh. And that's it for condition. And I, I think as you see that more and more people might want to grade their collections in the future, you know, as people age out of it and they want to sell it and they want to capture as much value as they can in it and they'll send in their collection, you're going to see this all the time. Yeah, yeah. Over time, it's only logical that the, the average grade for a CIV will go down, right? Because presumably the, the nicer supply is graded first. Mm -hmm. uh, and and all, that same thing is true for sealed when it comes to retro product. Mm. Yeah. Never considered Do you that. feel like that's what you, you have been seeing at water? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, you know, obviously there are, there are outliers in either direction that we'll see sure. often. Um, but, but yeah, yeah. When it comes to, um, what we see on a daily basis, I, I do think like over time, um, we see the things that maybe in 2019 someone looked at and was like, oh, that's not worth grading right now. Um, mm -hmm. But today someone's like, well, you know, supply is dried up. There are no alternatives. I did never find that better copy. I, sh I may as well just do this one. Makes sense. Hmm. Yeah. What, um, so your earliest memories were Joust, early PC. When did you... And, and then, of course, then you transitioned in, into uh, Pokemon and whatnot. When did collecting kick in for you? Like, when did wanting to own or or start to expand your collection or the games you had, when when did that it, bug kick yeah. in? Yeah, um, that kicked in when I, when I was a teenager and had a job and, and had my own money. Because uh, I was one of those kids that um, to get a new gaming thing, it was either you wait for your birthday, you wait for a holiday, or you trade in what you have. Yeah. And so, like, um, I was so desperate to get the Halo Edition X original Xbox whenever that came out. Um, and I had an original Xbox already, but I ended up trading that Xbox, like, half of my Xbox games, my GameCube, and my entire GameCube collection, which had been rolled. I'd only gotten the GameCube stuff by trading up my N64 collection. And so um, I, I gave it all for that Xbox, which unfortunately I did not hold on to. I, I'm sure I sold it at some point. But um, but once I had my own money and my funds to like sustain things and it didn't have to become such a, such a barter system of to get new, you have to get rid of old. Um, that's when I started really collecting things. Do you, do you know what year generally that was like? Um, yeah, I, I would say 2007 is, is a safe estimate for when that would have been. Were, were you were you on Nintendo Age at all? I was not. Oh, wow. OK. Yeah. Matt, there are collectors outside of Nintendo Age. I hate there to tell are? you. That's there are. And there, there were, um, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, especially these days now that. Uh, there are still gone, collectors but... that don't even know that games are graded. Yeah, I, I can't blame you for trading absolutely everything to get Halo, though. Yeah, it was the coolest thing in the world, that <laughs> Xbox. That was a cool Xbox. I can't yeah. believe you traded your GameCube, though. And now yeah, I don't have to mention sweet. Halo because we've already done it. So yeah, I appreciate fair. that as well. Yeah. <laughs> Josh doesn't win. We win. <laughs> um, but actually, that kind of transit. Now, you also um, currently have an interesting niche in collecting and we talked about this a little bit before like you want to explain what that is because i i know little about it but i know what they are yeah yeah so I, my my big thing um uh, it's not my number one by by quantity in my collection but it's definitely what i feel probably most passionate about um is steel books uh, and i know like they they receive a lot of hate from both inside the hobby and outside the hobby I feel like the most common complaint I see about them, um, and and I think maybe one of the the biggest um, people who has the the most negative things to say about them is a uh, Tyler Default Gen. He hates steelbooks with a passion. Um, <laughs> he does but, hate steelbooks. But um, people always say like, "What are they there for?" Right? Like, it either doesn't match what's on the shelf with the rest of the game cases. It doesn't maybe even fit on the shelf if it's slightly different sized um it, it either like looks out of place or uh some some like rare examples don't even have like a disc or cartridge holder so like it's literally just 
uh, a performative box. But um, for me, like, I, I do think the metal aspect is kind of cool. Um, just tactily, I think, you know, I like the fact that it holds up better um, over time. And, it, you know, it's not as prone to like surface scuffing versus like plastic. Um, mm -hmm. But to me, it's all about the art. And, and, you know, steelbooks very often, if not almost always, feature either exclusive art that you're only getting, you know, a real physical version of via that steelbook. Uh, and in some cases, it's, it's original art that isn't available anywhere else and can even be hard to find like a, a digital version of that's not just a picture of the steelbook. So for me, it's all about the art hmm. and being able to have, you know, they put so much time and effort into them that oftentimes I think the art on the steelbook looks meaningfully better than the game cover um, or even a special edition cover or any variant like that. Um, so for me, that's that's what it's all about with steelbooks. So and, it maybe you can touch on the what i didn't know and maybe i did but i didn't yeah. really consider it the 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 steelbook is a brand itself and you were you were telling us about that a little bit and the other outliers that exist that are yeah. like steelbook but and not, not steelbooks that's that's yeah. what you got me they're like mega blocks the mega blocks of uh, I, that that's actually an incredible comparison um, yeah. So to, to 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 finish that analogy, Steelbook is is Lego in this situation, and Steelbooks um, are are a registered trademark of a company called Scanavo, who exists out of Germany, I believe. Um, Germans love Steelbooks. If you ever go on the German Steelbooks forums, like it it is uh, some of the most passionate people you'll ever see. But you um, need to make Steelbook Game Boy games, and then the the world will be over because they'll be the perfect collectible for a German. That would be really cool. <laughs> no, they, they love um, Game Boys. So. But yeah, so they're, you know, like every product, they're, they're going to be imitators and, and cheaper versions and, and knockoffs when it's a compelling product. And I, I think that's part of like, um, you know, what makes me believe that, you know, obviously these are well-liked um, overall because like, you know, even pretty selective manufacturers like Nintendo are still including them in almost every collector's edition they produce for the Switch uh, in 2024. Um, meanwhile, you know, we have, you know, 20 years of, of products like this existing. Um, but like you said, there are knockoffs. And I would say the biggest one is called Metal Pack. I forget who the manufacturer of that is, but um, I, in my opinion, if you hold one of each of them in your hand, you can definitely tell there's like a meaningful quality difference. But uh, as soon as you open it, you'll be able to tell what is what. Uh, Steelbooks usually have on the bottom right um, engraved in the, in the kind of plastic inner clamshell layer. It'll say st a stylized Steelbook logo. Um, okay. And then that's how you can tell if it's a Steelbook, although you, that is not always a, a tell that it's authentic because there, there are factories. Um, so, like that? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Um, but there are factories that um, will take Steelbooks. Uh, and I, I would actually, I'd love to figure out how they do this. I think it's very interesting. Um, and they do something to um, basically reprint over what it comes on the steelbook. And so they're either acquiring blank stock or new old stock of, of something that's undesirable. And they're printing new versions of steelbooks on official steelbook hardware, but it's not licensed. Um, so if you go on eBay or Etsy or whatever and search custom steelbook, you will find of a lot of examples. And a lot of them are physically authentic, but they're not licensed or original interesting and now you were mentioning that like or let's let's see let's think of the early that like the halo games are not steelbook is that correct right? wow yeah. because everybody yeah, and, and that's part of why they rust so bad um not to say that i've never seen a steelbook that rusts um depends on the era um yeah sorry josh i know um, I, that that I didn't one is it. yeah um but but a lot especially I'm sure their coding techniques have gotten better over time, but um, I don't know that I have any steel books that are with, that are manufactured in the last 15 years that have any rust on them. And as far as what we see on the grading side, I don't think I've ever seen an official steel book with rust. So when we keep calling halo Two a steel book, we're, we're wrong. So you can say it's a steel book, <laughs> but no capital S no capital B because the, the trademark is capital S capital B. So it's, it's kind of like a, a Kleenex situation. Yeah, yeah. Everybody, it gets grouped in. Yeah. Now, on the Wii, is Cursed Mountain, is that a steel book or is that a knockoff? I'm 
pretty sure it's a metal pack, but I'm not 100% sure. And then Actually, it's not I, a Prime a steel book or is that a knockoff? I believe that one is official. Okay. All right. Those are early. Yeah, like, they I, are. I'm trying to like think of the earliest games that I can. And the um, Metroid Prime trilogy is like the earliest one I can think of outside of Curse Mountain. Yeah, what but, would be the first steel book? Like, what what was their first? Do you know? That's it's a like great some question. DVD. It's some yeah, movie. It's a, First and foremost, and, and this is still true today, they are a movie company, a oh, multimedia yeah. company. Um, it's some martial game. arts movie. I looked it up at one point. Yeah. Um, and it was uh, released in Germany. Yeah, yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah, exclusive. Um, but yeah, so like, the wor- I, I wish there was enough interest to do it on the video game side, what, what they do for movies. But um, basically for movies, there will be all of these different Steelbook variants for new releases, like... Best Buy will get a version, Target will get a version, Amazon will get a version, and then like five different boutique online retailers across the globe will have their own official licensed unique art or with unique effects. You know, they'll have glow in the dark or it'll have some patina or it'll have embossing or, you know, anything like that. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's super cool, exorbitantly expensive to keep up with. I'm sure I only buy a handful of things like that, but um, it really is a, a big collecting niche in its own way and um i'm glad to see that it's still growing and and staying strong in games yeah i think it's neat i think it's neat when it's not associated like there's it's not packaged like that um beyond two souls right it's just like you said it's maybe a pre-order or um it didn't have the game in it yeah like i know a lot of sports um the ea has like a fifa 13 and it, it wasn't sold that way it was just you got the case yeah, afterwards. yeah, I have like FIFA. I think I have like FIFA three through twenty two or thirteen through twenty two up on yeah. my wall, um, and they weren't sold like that. They were no. Just... The, everyone I've got has been like separate. Yeah, um, a lot. They still make them in Europe. I don't see them too much in the U.S. anymore for FIFA. Well, FIFA's gone yeah. now, but um, but yeah, my personal preference when it comes to steel books is for it to be secondary like a bonus item rather than primary packaging. I usually don't like that. And, and like, I've been, um, you know, kind of neurotic enough in my own collecting to where like, if a game only came in Steelbook or, or at least for the edition that I bought, I will go out of my way to acquire a legitimate, like regular case version for like a PS4 game or a Switch game or something so that I have something for like my real shelf to represent that item. Makes sense. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I should start buying some of them. I think they're neat, but yeah, they're I cool. Never went down that road. I have the Bo Jackson one. Yeah, that one's awesome. Twenty-two or twenty-three? Yeah, twenty-two. Twenty-two. Yep. Yep. That was a standalone, no game. Yeah. I'm hmm. really, I'm really curious now what the first video game steel book was. Then that's a good question. I wish I had the answer, and and it makes me want to look it up. It's got to be um, Metroid Prime trilogy. It's nothing before that. I don't know. We'll have to find it's out. It's not Halo yeah. 2 because that's a knockoff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Maybe one of the listeners will chime in and let us know. So. Or if Curse Mountain is a actual steel book, then that would be first because I believe that's before Metroid Prime. Yeah, I think Curse Mountain was 09, maybe, or 2010. That's a dumb game. Um, yeah, not a good game. Not a good game. Yeah, I've seen a couple of copies of it through the years. So Halo was ahead of the curve then, if you're talking 2000. Yeah. Well, I mean, like yeah. I showed you also the um, the GameStop Resident Evil 4 is a tin, right? Right. Yeah, like, that, that's why I think the, the first official Steelbook probably has to be before even the Halo, right? Because like, what would they be copying? If, you know, if we, if the assumption is that the, the knockoffs are copies, the real thing had to exist. And maybe they just got the idea from movies if they didn't do games yet, but it's a good well, question. Well, Halo 2, what year did that come out, Matt? Oh, 2000... I, I knew you were going to put me on that spot. It's, it's a not 04. It's yeah. November, November or December. What, was it late November 04? Sounds right. It's 03 or 04, for sure. Need to guess. Yeah, it's 04. Um, it's so far so when did steelbook was this out 
Oh, these sorry. Are, these are wild questions. Sorry, this is a water. This is VGA. This is a VGA. <laughs> my, my apologies. I just grabbed whatever I saw. Anyway. Huh. I, I think it's really fascinating. I'm Googling it now. Um, and I, I, it's a problem with me. I, I see something, I learn more about something, and then I start going down the rabbit hole of like trying to find it and buy it. Uh, Dan Gomez really got me started on the inserts for Hollywood video inserts for mm -hmm. Xbox and PS2. And I, I'm obsessed with those. Like, I'm so pumped when I find a new one, even if it's the same art, like yeah. I, and I take them out of their sleeve. I try to clean them up if they have stickers on them and I have binders of these damn things now, like from PS one up to Wii. Nice video sleeve inserts. What, what is the latest one you've ever found? I have some 360, I think in PS three, okay. um, the, the game. Um, I'm not sure. I I haven't really looked at it that way. I think I I have Skyrim. Yeah, I'm just curious where the cutoff is. Like, yeah. when did they stop doing them? When did the stores close? I definitely have a Skyrim, or two yeah. on PS3. So, yeah, it's it's fun stuff. It's a stupid thing to collect, but it's it keeps me excited when I go to Goodwill. Right, gotta buy something if I go in the store. Yeah, it's the rule. It's the rule. It's horrible. Um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll look in the steel book. I, I think that's pretty neat and I'll probably start buying them now. Sorry, Tyler Wilkins. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, default gen. yeah. Do you have any, Claire, do you have any crazy collecting stories? Oh, let's see. Crazy collecting stories. Yeah. Like typically like for us, it's like finds in the wild or something like that. Yeah. yeah I think a lot of my. I mean, truly, a lot of my best finds are are like Craigslist, Facebook Market, Marketplace era, where in, in the early pandemic times were especially good for this. But um, just the ability to to pick up stuff um, and turn it into like a much bigger deal. Right. Where, you know, you go for one item and you're like, oh, do you have anything else? Yeah. And then you you swing that into a 15 game pickup or with a console or something like that. Um, and cause like my, my MO in, in those days and, and, you know, even still, I just, I don't have the time or energy for it now, but, um, was like, I, I go and, you know, I'm getting things to either, you know, it's got 10 games in the lot. I'm keeping two of them. I'm selling the rest. And then I'm using that, those funds to buy these two other games that I want. And that, that was my cycle for years and years and years was just, doing that, you know, the grind to, to build what I wanted and everything else had to go. Um, so I found that very fun and, and very, you know, worthwhile. And, and I would pick up a, a 30 game lot if there was only one game I wanted and it like made sense financially to, to, to move the whole thing. Um, so I have a lot of great memories like that. Um, and in terms of a specific, go ahead, Matt. Yeah. I think that stands out. And, and I like that you point that out because you know, we all we all know some some collectors. Probably nobody that listens to this, but some collectors, you know, frown on you know buying and selling, and they just call you resellers. But almost every collector I know, that's how they built. They started their collection and built up was you bought lots, you kept you know what you needed. I still I still do it um, personally, uh, but <laughs> yeah, Matt comes to Portland Retro Gaming Expo every year with like six Wii's and like some random duplicate games that I picked up. <laughs> He's like, I just want to sell them. <laughs> yeah, no shame. No, no shame. Um, yeah. Like, I think probably one of the better better deals I ever got was um this this was pandemic era, so it wasn't all that long ago, but it was a guy who was moving to China. And so he had he had to like get rid of everything he owned um mm -hmm. basically to move over there. And so he sold me um, I think three different um, Zelda uh, 3DX, 3DS XLs or normal 3DS or 2DS um, variants um, alongside with like two computer monitors and then like a bunch of games for DS and 3DS. Um, and, and so that, you know, that was one of those ones of circumstance where he's like, hey, um, 
I, I got to move out tomorrow and I'm leaving the country. Like it has to go. So from a negotiating standpoint, you can do pretty well whenever, <laughs> whenever somebody doesn't have a lot of options. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but those are the ones, like the, the rush I get from either a swap meet or like a, you know, a, an online message where it's like, okay, I'll be right there. Like, um, please mark it as pending. Uh, I'll prepay or, you know, whatever. Um, nothing gives me a rush like that. It, it really is the best. That, 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 that sums up collecting really yeah. right there. Yeah. That if Matt, if Matt calls me tomorrow and says, I found a rental store, I, that is the biggest rush in the world for me. Like, let's go talk to the person. Let's figure this out. Let's get it. It's like once every 10 years, but yeah, no, that happens. I feel like one's coming, Matt. I do. I feel we're, like we're due. due for a fun. <laughs> it's been a while. Um, yeah, that's it. The rush is definitely. Yeah. I'm it, almost nostalgic about the rush. Yeah. The past, like it's, it's, just... it's the best. Like it's um, I, I would believe that it's what people who, you know, take substances to feel something. I, that's what I feel. That's yeah. the closest thing I can associate with that. And it's like, all right, you know, it, if I could bottle this feeling, I would be, you know, unstoppable, but um, yeah. it is hard to come by. Well, yeah, it's, even just hearing that gives me that feeling of that rush, you know, I'm just yeah. like, yeah, I can totally relate and this time. And yeah. Yeah. You don't have to be a YouTube personality to get the deals. You don't have to, you know, buy everything on eBay. All you got to do is just get off your ass in the morning and go to some garage sales. That's it. Yeah. That was You're always like the day I die. Like, yeah, you want to collect. It's still affordable. You just got to go look for it. Yeah, totally. That that was my game plan is was always just attrition, right? Like I'm gonna mm -hmm. check, I'm gonna refresh the search more times than you, and I'm gonna get there faster than you, and I'm gonna send more messages than you. Like that was that was my way to win, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I love that word. Attrition's a good word. Yeah. Uh, always think about that and how many games have survived since production. Like what is the rate of attrition on video yeah. games in general? You know, like I wish that numbers production numbers were public not sold mm. sale numbers and now those numbers are totally skewed because of digital downloads and counting them as sales right yeah. and so when you see like a sales number of mario 3 on wikipedia or whatever like they sold this many million copies of this game like is that in the u.s is that what what does that mean you know is that include japan where, where does this number come from you know so i I argued with somebody about like I genuinely believe that they will that between all grading companies, WADA, CGC, and VGA if they ever grade CIBs, that they'll never grade twenty thousand CIB left rows ever. I don't think it will happen. You know, like because everybody was like, oh, it's like Hulk one eighty one where there's thousands and thousands of that shit graded. There's just you won't have the opportunity to grade 20,000 CIB Mario 3 left bros. Probably yeah, Mario 3. I, I think that's a safe bet. And the game has sold millions of copies. Like, I, I'm fascinated by the idea that this stuff doesn't exist and we have no clue how to calculate a rate of attrition on it at all. Hmm. So, anyways, I think about that with classic cars, you know, because they do yeah. calculate that shit because they do know production numbers. Yeah, so. T, like I, this has been a topic I've heard discussed in in many places throughout the years. But do you think the manufacturers or the publishers? Do you think they even know in a lot of these cases? No, I get the impression I, they don't. No, I think they did. I don't think they thought it was necessary information. Yeah. Um, to right. to hold on to from thirty years ago. I also think that it's really cool when those double pack GameCube games came out on eBay. Did you see those? And yeah. the person had production numbers of what uh, Coke M was. It wasn't a Coke M. Yeah. I think uh, that they, they said we made 10,000 of this, 5,000 of this and 6,000 of this. I'm like, that's an amazing number to have on a production sheet. And you just like prove the point that these are genuinely rare items, but those were like repacks. So I, I don't know if that we'll ever know. Maybe yeah. we'll get some numbers one day. But yeah. I don't think they know generally. And and if they do know, they they certainly don't like care enough to share it. And and a very recent example of this was 
um, when it comes to overall console unit sales, um, you know, the switch um, is creeping up there. I think it's in the mid, mid to low 140s, 140 million at this point. Wow. And the record for forever, everyone has always referred to it as the PS2 is number one with I think 155 million units. That's been the line for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and then in a, in a, some sort of call or interview with the, the now former CEO of PlayStation, Jim Ryan, he said like two months ago, he was like, oh, it's actually 160 million. And it's like, this has been the story for 10 years. And it's like, all, what it took was another console getting close to and potentially breaking that number for them to mm -hmm. update their number. And then everyone like alleges that, oh, you're lying or you made it up. And it's like, no, it's probably true, but they just had no reason to correct the record until now. Um, right. But, it, but things that are totally accepted as fact um, yeah. just go unchecked until there there's some incentive but if he yeah. says 160 now he can't really veer from that yeah yeah I'm, that was their one time if they were yeah. going to fudge the numbers they can't do it again yeah <laughs> well i think that's interesting the sold unit would be the unit that's sold to the distributor or wherever yeah. it's going it's not going to be to the end user right these are the it's not even going to be the produced number i don't know it's interesting the whole idea and concept of production numbers is what will drive collecting if it, if it can be published. So somebody like uh, Greg Pavic of uh, Active that owns Active Enterprises, him sharing those production numbers. I think he shared them with Dan Allegra on on Minus Worlds when Dan ran that site, and I, I think that that's helpful for collectors. But unfortunately, nobody wants Cheat Man too or um, action 52 because those games generally are the like what rarity really is right like they made 2500 cheetah man twos they made 10,000 ac action 52s that's a rare video game in the whole scheme of things so getting that information out there uh, i think that's going to be a big thing and i i hope it does come out one day on different consoles so I, I know that Howard Phillips did have some information about Nintendo at one point. Um, and I had talked to Frank about it a little bit. Uh, and it was, it was interesting that uh, I think stadium events wasn't even like in the realm of like, this is a rare game with the production numbers that they actually made. Now, if what happened to those copies, you know, it's anybody's guess at this point, but uh, the, some of the other ones that were rare were games like Schoon, you know, games that were only printed one time. And I, I believe Nintendo had a minimum order quantity of 10,000, but that number was also kind of skewed because it wasn't, they weren't sure. I, I think I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I, I think what he was saying was, was it 10,000 an amalgamated number from the publisher within that year? Or was it per title? Like, I, I don't think that's known. So if it was Bandai publishing 10,000 games out of the gate, they would have had Chubby Sherb, Ninja Kid, and Muscle. Would they split that across all the games, or would it be 10,000 each? So rare stuff out there. But right. Those numbers are going to really help drive value and collectability in the future. But of course, you always have, have other factors like with Xbox and Microsoft where they, you know, their hard drives got compromised and they lost their numbers. Like they had numbers when it comes to like Halo collecting and stuff. A lot of their early information is just gone because the hard drives got destroyed. So but that's where certification and grading comes in. You guys track how many have come through in your hands. Now that's never going to be perfect, but it's going to be something. Yeah. Some data is better than no data. Yeah. Speaking I mean, of data, VGA did release their pop reports, and yeah, let as me... soon as they released them, I wasn't on my phone for about a week because I was on vacation. But they, as soon as they released them, they were pulled off the internet. I was going to say, yeah. let me pull that up. I I wanted to pull that up for this episode. Uh, Dylan had done a podcast or or a quick little blip on it, and uh, I was like, oh yeah, he was quick to get it. Good for him. And um, I figured we'd touch on it anyway. And when I pulled it up today, I was like, it's gone. What the hell? Yeah, they pulled it down. Um, Why? I don't know. Uh, I think Clearly. they had I think they had some unfortunate um, potential data leaks as part of what could be found if you were 
snooping in, into the pop report data when it comes to customer info. Oh, so that's just from what I've seen. I don't know if that's verifiably true, but um, anybody can go developer mode on a browser and and start snooping around. And so I think they're um, just taking extra precautions. Oh, yeah. that would make a lot of sense. Okay. Yeah. Well, because I, I was really it's... disappointed. I wanted to get into them because I was like, oh, but, well, this would be fun. But okay. Well, also, maybe they realize they needed to fix their data a little bit and remove shit that has been cracked out of cases. Um, and, you know, that that's important information. Even if it's been re-slabbed and put back in their case, that's fine. But I know a lot of it hasn't. Some of it has. I, I think that they have some of the information. And I, I've seen it. Claire has put it out there for the world to see that They've shared the VGA uh, numbers that have been cracked out. I think that's a big deal, you know, and I think that CGC is willing to share numbers with uh, WADA. At least I've seen it firsthand. Like they came up to the WADA booth at the Portland show and handed them a stack of certification numbers to deactivate. So I, I think it's a big deal if companies can get together. And we've talked about this in the past, Matt, that they can share this data so the data is more accurate and in line with what exists first doesn't so yeah 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 i feel pretty strongly about that and i know the rest of our our team does as well um and like you said josh yeah there, we do have you know a handshake agreement with cgc to to pass back and forth those physical labels um and thankfully that's possible right just given what our products are and, and you know how cumbersome are those labels to get out or to remove thankfully it's very easy um, for for really both of our um, cases, mm -hmm. but in the case of EGA, it's not realistic to you know physically hand those off to anybody associated with BGA. So um, our solution was to publish those numbers uh, on a, a public facing blog post that's that's closing in on probably about a year and a half old now, um, and and we're still adding to that data. Okay, so you're um, constantly updating that. We are, yeah. So anything okay. that is crossed over in, in real time um, is is being added to that sheet um, as well as um, when it comes to old data, um, we do still have the ability to scrape the VGA cert numbers. We know what the games are and we know what the VGA grades were and those counts are accurate. Um, but at the time, the, the actual VGA cert numbers were not logged, um, but we do have the ability to go back and, and find them. Um, okay. and, and and it is tedious, and um, but it's something that I think is important and that we're prioritizing because um, I think Josh, like you said, that that element of transparency. Um, whenever you look up um, everyone's pop reports, once everyone has them in their live, I think it's important for those to be as accurate as possible. Um, yeah. Otherwise, really, you're just you're you're making every item seem less rare or less valuable or anything like that. Exactly. Uh, if you want to, uh, if you want to search it, um, yeah, yeah, at yeah, the top sure. right, I think if you do census in right that here, search Matt. bar, yeah. Um, oh, spell that for me, please. Uh, C E N S U S C. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, there you go. Far left. I'm just moving this. Hmm. Yeah, I would hope they would they would do that. They, just as I would hope that, you know, because there's nothing like going on there and saying, hey, there's nine Hangtab Castlevanias that graded at VGA when, ah. I know two of those have been crossed. So that's not nine. And we're talking about a Hangtab Castlevania. So now there's a one coming up in a CGC holder and people are going to refer to that and say, oh, there's already nine of those graded there. And Watt is graded four, I don't know, three or four. Like so, there that makes the population what, and then there's the CGC one. So there's there's fourteen of these things out there, and that's not accurate information. Yeah, so yeah. It, it really it benefits no, it benefits no one. It's bad it's for a, the buyers. It's, it's bad for thing. the sellers. It's bad for the companies. Really, there's no benefit in those numbers being artificially inflated. No. So I'm missing a couple, but I can help you fill them out. That's okay. I, well, we'll always take the data. <laughs> but I think it would also be, it would be cool if VGA was pretty open and communicative about it and saying, hey, if you do crack one yourself, here, send us the label, right? Yeah. Like, 
Yeah, and that's a policy. I got, I got a stack of water labels for you, Claire. I'm gonna send Great. to you. We'll take them. So. This is awesome. Like, yeah. I didn't know this was here. Yeah, and I didn't know it was continually updated. I think that's yeah, a it is deal. live. So like wow. if you if you pay close enough attention, if something is cracked on a Tuesday, it'll be there on a Tuesday. Wow. This is well, maybe awesome. we'll get uh, um the guy on Discord that uh, Eloist, I think is his name. Yeah. Who just, somehow figures out what's graded and does the the WADA cert verification and looks up every new game. Yeah. Maybe you should track this too. So oh. that's pretty wild. Yeah, this is fun stuff. Now that I know this is here. Okay. That's cool. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. Um the only other thing I had was I don't know why this I, was a wild lot. I saw this too. Um, if anybody's looking to spend fifteen hundred dollars on Thor autographs, I'm happy to put you in contact with Thor, and he would happily take fifteen hundred dollars from you. So, uh, just let me know. What? What? There, oh, because there's a Thor autograph in here. Is there's that... a there's a couple of them. Oh, so, okay. yeah. Um, Interesting. Yeah, this was it's like a stack of paper from Dane. I love it. The coolest thing in here is the HES Home Entertainment Supplier Gauntlet um, catalog booklet down there. I think that's pretty neat. There's some neat things here. A lot of shit, though. Hmm. I, I just thought it was an interesting sale. I, I I had figured maybe you were watching it or bidding on it. but Yeah, it was driven by uh, the Thor autographs, as far as I, I can tell. Got so. it. 15, for those who are just listening, $1,500. Um, yeah, like he he signed the what is it there the Nintendo Power the world the NWC uh, mini guide or is that a poster? No, it looks like a poster. It looks like the reproduction poster they put with the NA Homebrew um, campout edition. Actually, um, yeah. click the other picture, Matt, down below. You can see it there. Yeah, there's like a card that he signed there and. There's another poster. It said in the description that there was a couple of Thor autographs. Huh. It was, yeah. a, it was a heritage sale for anybody that's listening that happened on the weekly just uh, a day ago. Yeah. I'll tell you what, if I could throw a pile of inserts and manuals up on eBay and get $1,500, I would do it every day. <laughs> amazing. That was an amazing sale. I know a pile of inserts I could sell you for $1,500. I will I will pay you fifteen hundred dollars for those interests, Matt. <laughs> I know you would. <laughs> Too bad I won't sell them to you. Um <laughs> you son of a bitch. <laughs> Claire, is there anything else you, you would like to touch on that we you know yeah, maybe might have skipped over? Yeah. Uh, as far as WADA. Um, good question. Um, you know, we do have exciting things coming up in the future through the rest of the year, but some sooner than later. Um nothing that i can that i can spoil at this okay. exact moment um if, if that's um what we think is best but um but soon you won't have to wait long after this episode is published in order to to find out what we've got cooking um that should be some unique and 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 value add um offerings that that nobody else is offering right now okay Very awesome cool. uh i don't think we should spoil it i no, 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 no. I'm, I'm not going to, and I don't want to. I don't want to wait to post this. Um, yeah, um, and we, we can we, crop that all out too. So. We, we, we normally uh, read comments. Do you want to read comments with us? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> uh oh, we'll see what. <laughs> Is Dan Kaplan comment this week? I, I didn't look at any of the comments. I love not looking because. Yeah. It just makes it more fun. Um, yeah, I bailed last week. I was in Palm Springs. I had a great time. And so we didn't do a podcast last week. I want to so. go with the whole... Let me Give me one second. Let me find the window. Wait, here. you were in Palm Springs during Coachella, but not for Coachella. Exactly. You know why? You go during the week in between the concerts and nobody goes to Palm Springs to the hotels. And yeah. the, the, the Hyatt where we stayed... Uh, the, there was literally nobody there for like yeah. four days. Okay, it should be in the screen. Oh man, I was angry on this one. So, Is this the one where you went cussing? Yeah, I, I gotta stop. I gotta okay. reel it in. Well, sorry, Claire. You're good. <laughs> yeah. I even look mad. Damn. 
<laughs> Thanks, Matt. Um, we'll skip over them if if they're too. Um, Eric Stuggan. Um, Twenty two comments. Yeah, we got a lot. That's why I was like, all right. Was, oh, Timmy J. I'd love Timmy. to have him back on. What's that? I'd love to have Timmy back on. See what's going on with the gamer stocks. But I guess can't. Yeah. Yeah, I wish. Uh, I'm devastated that that functionality that a, is gone. That was yeah. such a nice, clean, easy site to use. Yeah, fantastic. Very unfortunate that it went away. Yeah. Well, you win some, you lose some. But he's back. Yeah. He's commenting. Great good. To have back. Best intro ever. I don't even remember. Uh, that's okay. Uh, didn't Eric introduce us? That's right. We want we really like to force him to introduce us. Yeah, that's right. I, I almost pulled it on Claire, but I didn't want to, you know, <laughs> All right. Okay. Decap Maybe. says, oh, go for it. Claire, you want you want uh, you gotta know Dan. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like Dan. Uh, we met at Portland. Um, oh, that's right. You did meet Dan right. years ago. Yeah. Um, very nice guy. Um, we we've talked many times over back in the clubhouse days um we, we would chat pretty often so yeah i like dan a lot um he leaves a comment saying loving the fancy shelf and matt rose's background which i agree it looks great the lighting is very slick thank you you've probably touched every one of those games <laughs> there's a there's a chance <laughs> i'm just saying <laughs> <laughs> oh man thank you dan appreciate and love you um, and then look at this guy. What's he doing? Twenty dollars and ninety nine cents. Canadian. Canadian. That's like two dollars. <laughs> Give me my the two dollars. <laughs> they don't even have a dollar menu at McDonald's anymore, Dan. What can I get with that? Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Not quite a Big Mac, but yeah. Uh, well, well, we do. Um, thanks, we Dan. Do. Okay. We do appreciate it. Looks like it's uh whoa, we got Matt on here commenting on his own video. Michelle asked why there are four of us. There's only supposed to be three, according to her. That's right. Sorry, Michelle. It was past your bedtime. I don't know what you're watching. Uh and I'm not gonna be able to keep up with these, am I? <clears throat> uh Josh's mom. Oh. We know who Josh's mom is. Um, can we say it doesn't matter. We know it's Henry. Thanks, Henry. Uh, yeah, I forgot to send you the invite, bro. My bad. If the initials <laughs> didn't give it away on the YouTube avatar. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was like, well, it is right there. And yeah, I didn't want to mention I was going to Norway because I just <clears throat> don't like people who know that I'm gone for a couple of weeks. So but it was a lot of fun. Uh, beautiful country. If you anybody who likes to travel and wants to see some beautiful country, Norway is gorgeous. Um, yeah. Uh, where? Right. Wait. Uh, yeah. Timothy <laughs> Josephic says, "Uh, the fifth has been pleaded." Um, which I think that that's a probably a direct reference to what we were talking about just a few minutes ago when we started yeah. the comments. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, I can't talk about it. It's fair. Um, your average IT guy, what can you do? So. <laughs> Average IT guy. Oh, I'm just kidding. It was such. It was so. Well, I gotta stop talking about it. I don't That's okay. It. We'll we'll let it rest. You know, maybe something else will come back. Maybe um, yeah, maybe not. All right, Josh. Okay, you got this one, Matt. I'll read this one. Um, Mr. Michael says I just ripped Murder She Wrote, the complete series, to my Plex server. Yes, and my wife and I are big fans. Matlock is a great show too. I agree, Michael. Matlock, Murder She Wrote. He's got Columbo next. I can imagine. Uh, Michael's right. our fifth biggest fan. He's a good dude. He's a good dude. Super nice guy. Um. And by the way, Michael, we still have to go out to uh, we we have to go out to dinner at. Uh, oh my gosh, why am I spacing it? You know where I'm talking about. <clears throat> Gustav's. Get no. The, oh. No. Um, Claire, you want to take this one? Yeah. Uh, they said, 
uh, HW5091 says, I've been back-ended before. Eh, it happens. Part of the game. I don't worry about it. I assume they mean backdoored, yeah. uh, which <laughs> this has got to be the most uh, laissez-faire response to backdooring. I, I don't know. I don't want to, you know, lobby any accusations, but this sounds like exactly what a backdoor would say. Get over <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, or laissez-faire, yeah. I agree. Maybe they just yeah. don't want to worry too It's a great attitude. I, I wish. It I is wish. a good attitude because it um, happens so often to, yeah. and, you know, I will give it to Eric. He has a very laissez-faire attitude about it at this point. He doesn't make a stink. And so yeah. I was upset for him last week and I apologize, but I still <laughs> think it's bullshit and I don't think you should do it. That's just my opinion. So yeah. poor Eric, if, I feel like he's been the victim. Him, I, I respect that. If you want to just let sleeping dogs lie, that's a good way to look at it. Yeah. Um, it's hard to let them lie when you lose out though, on stuff. So, yeah. Okay. Eric, Eric's taken the brunt of, I mean, literally worst backdooring I've ever, like the, the saddest losses in the world. And he doesn't, he doesn't even mention half of them. No. He's, he's, He's a he's a good sport. He's you have to he, pry it from him. Like a game will show up on Heritage and it will sell. He's like, oh yeah, I bought that, but I got backdoored on. I'm like, oh, sucks. <laughs> but whatever. Moving on. All right, uh, Tony. Oh, our good friend Tony uh, Dean. Arcade Light with Beanie with, Baby Greater. With with all the yeah. that's what she said references. I'm assuming Waffle Foot has a reference uh, to the episode where Michael Scott rolled out of bed and stepped onto a waffle iron. Mind blown. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point. My favorite Office episode is when Kevin's bringing the chili into the office, and he spills it all over the floor. That's like the best. Um, I love Scott's tots. I, I embrace the, tots. The, 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 <laughs> I embrace the cringe of that episode. Yeah. Or is this, the, is hard, this, the hardcore parkour is pretty good too. Is this That's the good office? One. Parkour yeah. Michael. Yeah, American office. I, I haven't seen the office before. Wow. Are you kidding me, Matt? No. I is it something I That's should shocking. Watch? It's the best. You got to start from the beginning and just watch it all the way through. I realized that one of my most favorite lines ever is from that show that I used, but I didn't know that. That's what she said. Yeah. 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 (laughs) All right. Go for it, Josh. Okay. eBay should have done an eBay auctions for themselves with open bids for grading companies to bid the highest for a (laughs) merchant (laughs) deal. I was like, wait, what am I reading? That's true. They should have. No, I don't think that would work. Somebody would backdoor it. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, Christopher, look at you. Go for it. Fire if you want, if you keep wanting. Yeah, yeah go for I got it. it. Uh, Christian per year says DK Jr. Math Canadian box does exist. I had one in my collection. I sold it about a decade ago, but I still have pictures. Ooh, I love things like let's this. See He's come. Let's see the pictures. Send them to Matt, and um, we'll text them to Eric, and Eric's gonna cry for the rest of his life. So yeah, I feel like this is an exceptional example of this where they say they have pictures versus oh, but I don't have pictures or I lost the pictures. Maybe um, yeah. very I, promising when they say they've got them. I nobody. Okay. So I had this space Hulk long box and it, um, way back on digital press days. And it, the long box list was finally complete. Like I think uh, danger boy, Jason at the time, this is a long time ago. He's like, okay, here are the things space Hulk does not have a long box. And um like there wasn't like a definitive list of all the long box PS one games at the time for collectors. And so he was doing it. And uh, I was like, well, wait, space folks does, it does exist. You know, I, I had one and I sold it on eBay for $72. And um, he's like, Oh no, it doesn't. I'm like, yeah, I have the picture. So I had the picture. I showed him. Turns out it was like a promotional display box. that I had, I didn't even know. So. And you sold uh, it for $72. I didn't know what it was. I was I was like 2002, 2001. No, it was yeah, I was in high school when I yeah, maybe I just graduated high school. But it was it was I was selling shit on eBay trying to make money. Right? 
I didn't collect PS1. I was an NES to a T. So I was selling all the garbage I didn't want. Wish I would have kept that one. I think that Zach actually owns that exact same long box. I kind of tracked it over the years. Zach owns everything. That fucking so does Rare Bucky. Yeah, uh, Bucky's got cool stuff. D decaps. Just want to make one small correction. You said I couldn't make the show because of the cost of tea in China. Truth is, I couldn't make, the, make it because I was too busy teabagging people in China. It's just crazy. <laughs> Oh, Matt must have got the text backwards then. So, sorry. <laughs> oh, <All> right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, wait, wait, wait! Oh, you spelled your wrong, Matt. Oh well, that's good. I'm gonna keep it up wrong. It's better that way. <laughs> Yeah. I love the edit function on iPhone now. I'm always like, "You're you, no, you are." Oh shit! I always do that. Okay. All right. Claire, you got this one. Yeah. Uh, Rad Workshop says, "Have any of you dipped your toes into arcade machines? I've got a couple, but they are just so big. My favorite is a Capcom bowling that I got dirt cheap. Turns out it's a converted Pac-Man. Needless to say, it's now a Pac-Man again." That's a nice. Yeah. Um... One of, uh, I mean, I only have so much space personally, um, but I have three in the room, um, maybe a fourth coming. And then uh, if I get this new area, I'll have more. But uh, yeah, I had a friend who started off with just a couple and now it's it's a, a next level pinball museum in Hillsboro. If anybody has ever gone um, or hasn't gone and you go to Hillsboro, if you can dig up an hour and go, go, it is the most incredible thing you've ever seen. Uh, and I believe they're like the second or third biggest arcade in the world now. It's and amazing. it's, they just expanded again. It's, it's absurd. It is ridiculous. I, I say anybody should go, but um, Capcom bowling. I remember the game in the arcade down here. And uh I would turn a Capcom bowling back into a Pac-Man as well. I, I, prob I, I probably would, um, but popular cabinet to uh, to swap over, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Claire, have you dabbled in arcades at all? Not in terms of ownership. Yeah. Um, okay. Back in Denver, there there were a lot of um, really amazing arcades, and especially pinball arcades. Um, yeah, the the I've been to that uh, that barcade in Denver. I, I can't yeah. remember what it was called but they they had a tapper um, mm. machine that was converted to the local beer oh, like that's the cool. rom file had been changed and it was the whatever brewery there yeah so it, that's super awesome it was a neat one yeah i remember going to that um that's a cool arcade i actually went with kenneth and dennis yeah like, like 2018 <laughs> so <laughs> um almost done yeah you no know, i have a uh, Miss Pac-Man cocktail cabinet that I need to get a monitor in um, and then a, a full Simpsons arcade cabinet that was a run and gun cabinet that was converted to a Simpsons cabinet so I put new artwork on it reproduction artwork and it's an original Simpsons board um, yeah and it, it works but it's massive and I probably should get rid of it so yeah they take up so much space I have a nice area to put it, but it, it it it's really a cool machine too. It's like my favorite game as a kid, going to the pizza parlor or the ice cream or Ferrell's here in town. They had a they had that game, and I I would play it all the time. Yeah, we talk we talk about memories and experiences, and 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 that feeling you get. A lot of that you know relates to growing up and playing the arcade games at the pizza parlors and arcades and yeah right. uh miss josh or you claire i don't know i'll read it okay. ha 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 the drawing did get framed hell yeah it can be made into shirts as my royalty payment i'll just take one firm handshake if we meet in person <laughs> this is from log snacks log snacks made us a wonderful uh drawing i think it's going to be our new um podcast t-shirt matt <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't know if I can translate that into a t-shirt, but I can try. And just a white shirt with the stick figures. Perfect. Um, I think you've made it when you're getting original art of your of your show. <laughs> from, from the viewers. So. Yeah. <laughs> it's getting and then uh, also I'm the guy backdooring everyone. I don't give a damn. It's a sport to me. Well, come on the show like I asked. <laughs> Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, it's Chris. Claire, you want to tackle Chris? Yeah. Uh, Chris says, uh, I need to know the purchase that you regret yet love. Tell me about the pain of getting the best, worst thing ever. Ooh. There's a lot of ways this could go. Oh, yeah. Claire, do you have anything that pops in your mind? Um, I, can, I guess it could go a couple ways. It could go an overpay that, you know, was not a good deal but was worth it or something that's like you know kind of inherently terrible um but you still value um or probably other ways as well um i mean i think for me i have bought like um i actually have an item near me here it's a technically it's a a knockoff steelbook um and it's technically unlicensed because it came from uh, a retailer in China um, who did not license the item. Um, but it's for one of my favorite games of all time, uh, Near Automata. And it's totally unlicensed. It's, it's thicker uh, than your average steelbook. It doesn't have the correct hinges, um, but the art is really cool. It's got, it's multi-layered. It's got a little bit of embossing. Um, and it's like, it is legitimate, right? In the sense that it's it was from a real retailer using real art seemingly original art from what I can tell. Um, but it's definitely not licensed uh, and it's definitely not the real product and being a steel book. Um, mm. And so that's something that um, I love it. It was way too expensive for what it is because, you know, you can imagine for, you know, someone who's only buying off of eBay or the like, um, Chinese pre-order bonuses are not popping up very frequently, especially not for uh, what is now a seven-year-old game. So um, that's an example of like, I, it was hard to swallow at the time, but I'm, I'm happy every time I see it. How about you guys? Awesome. Josh, you got something painful that you love? You, yeah, I know you do. Every year at Portland Retro Gaming Expo, you get that pained look after you're done bidding, but you loved it. I don't think I... I mean, yeah, I love it. I don't feel that bad about buying stuff like that, though. Like that mock-up box, I'm thrilled, right? I didn't know I was going to spend $3,500, but I didn't. I needed it because I'd never seen something like that, right? Yeah. So there's things like that. Um, it, it's probably something like the Simpsons cabinet. Like, it it pains me that it sits out there and it's taking up a ton of room, but it also, I love it to death. I don't want to get rid of it, but I really should. I, it's arcade one ups are great. They're practical, small, and you get the same effect of playing the game. And my kids can reach them, so I. That, that's probably one of them. I don't know. Probably everything that's in my storage unit that I totally ignore and don't look at. That's like something I love, but I regret having every day. Totes and totes of. Video game shit, broken consoles. Oh my you know? gosh. Yeah. Yeah. I love it though. <clears throat> so, anyways, yeah, something like that. Hmm. I like all the stuff I have. What can I say? Yeah. Gosh, I can't even think of something that I'd like would have bought that I regret, but I love it. Like, I don't. Hmm. That's a good question. I want to hear in the comments from people like, what do you, everybody's got to answer Chris's question here. That's a, that's, yeah, I'd have to, I'd have to think more on that. And I don't want to, man, that's a great question though. Um, I'll, I'll chime in if I, something pops into my head, but I, I can't. Well, there was plenty of games that I bought off Heritage that I regret paying my pay for and oh. then, uh, that I love. You know? Yeah, like, I mean, even recently, I sold a game. Okay, well, there's an example. I sold a, a Pac-Man first print to Heritage. Uh, 
and then I just bought it back. Uh, and I paid a little bit more than I expected to pay, but I love the game. So I'm just like, well, I kind of regret it, but, but whatever. <laughs> so it's a love yeah. hate because it's Pac-Man. It's first print. And like we were saying, it's a seven five. Uh, do I have it? I don't have it in here or I'll grab it in a minute, but seven five to me after grading enough games, you know, through WADA and, and knowing seven five for a sealed you know, especially first print Pac-Man to me is like a solid grade. It's a great grade. Um, and how many more of those are you going to find? And anyway, so that would be maybe my regret love because it's not really, it wasn't, I'm paying more than fair price for it at that point, but I don't care because yeah. I love it. So there you go. Uh, Blockbuster late fees first. Man, you are always first. Uh, Regular Ricky Bobby here. <clears throat> and Brian, uh, Josh, you won. Yeah, and if I win anything on Golden, I think I'm just going to tell people I won on eBay from now on. Yeah, it's a great, great loophole. Yeah. And then... If I'm going to sell anything on Golden, I'll just say I list it on eBay. And then Henry just repeated himself. I'm not sure why. I don't know why that's in here twice. It's okay. He just needed you to know how much he was disappointed in you and not inviting him. Oh, um, well, yeah, I, it, don't, I don't have anything else. Um, that's good. Yeah. It, uh, to be fair, uh, I, I went with my dad and uh, it was, a uh, you know, all older, older people. It was an older people cruise. I was probably the youngest one on there. Well, that's not true. There was like one or two other people, but, hmm. but actually it made it more fun. Um, Very cool. Yeah. Um, oh, so. Kaplan, why did he? Oh, not show yeah, yeah. Kaplan, <laughs> speaking of Kaplan not making it, uh, because it's maple syrup season, gotta tap those trees. <laughs> um, gotta tap the trees. Uh, <laughs> now how you get maple syrup out of a tree? I, I, you did tap it, not right? I, I think you're I right. Watch Riverdale on Netflix. Come on. <laughs> Uh, okay, let's do wins. Uh, what? Uh, Claire, you're the guest. Uh, what do you What do you got? You can go first. What do you got for wins? Yeah. Um. So I'll say the my favorite item that I've actually obtained in person this year. Um. I still have one that that's very important to me, but it's um kind of an in production slash in the mail type of thing that I won't have until um hopefully later this year. But um, long timelines on stuff like that, but. Uh, my favorite thing that I've acquired and, and actually kind of modified that I've received this year is a PS4 faceplate. Um, so the, the background of this item is that um, this is a for the final iteration of the PS4, also known as the PS4 Slim. Um, Sony made it to where it had interchangeable faceplates on the top of it, similar to like the old 360, except that it's um, the whole top of the console rather than just a sliver or a blade. Yeah. Um, and these were not popular. Sony didn't make very many of them. There were very few third party ones. I don't know why they did it. They didn't really advertise the functionality. It, it was a failed um, thing for, you know, a, a late revision console, but um, this is one that exists for uh, the game near automata, which is one of my favorite games and favorite franchises of all time. Um, and so I had the opportunity to acquire one of these um, in a way very similar to what we kind of talked about earlier, where um, it was more cost effective for me to buy uh, a whole PS4 um, that had this on it uh, and then get rid of the PS4 than it was for me to buy just this. Uh, they don't come up very often, um, but I, I was able to buy it internationally at, at, at what I thought was a reasonable price for an item that I otherwise cannot uh, obtain. Um, but then I was able to take it and then get it signed by uh, a handful of people. Uh, Yoko Taro, uh, the director and creator of the Nier series. Uh, Keiichi Okabe, who's the composer of the Nier series and one of my all-time favorites. Um, as well as Emmy Evans and Janique Nicole, who are two of the vocalists for both the original Nier and Nier Automata. Um, some of my, literally like one, one of my favorite soundtracks of all time, if not number one, um, as well as the composer. Uh, Eric Roth, who composed the live concert that this that I met these people at. Um, so actually, I had to travel 
um, you had the ability to get to bring a signed item um, in order to uh, if you went to the, the the concert series that was running around the country and, and really the world. Um, and I missed out on VIP for the Los Angeles show, um, but I was able to get VIP for another city uh, for the Dallas show, which is actually where I'm from. And so I flew to Dallas um, and stayed for a couple of days just to attend the concert again three days later. Uh, but most importantly, to get this signed. So this is definitely my my biggest win of the year. And uh, it's skyrocketed its way to the top of my favorite items in my collection. Wow, that is the, a heck of a story. And, and so when you bought the the PlayStation, you had to get another, was it hard to get just another top to replace that to resell it with? Or I sold it without a faceplate. It is. <laughs> oh, it was wow. remarkably <laughs> difficult to get yeah. even a blank one. That Like that. that's kind of like, emblematic of the problem that existed with these swappable ones like there were not replacement ones made that were easily accessible we're also talking about you know a, a revision that was released i think in 2016 or 2017 so very old news at this point but um yeah i sold it without a faceplate at a discount because I, I genuinely couldn't find a replacement wow interesting i'd have to buy another ps4 to get a replacement and then i just have this endless string of <laughs> faceplateless ps4s <laughs> Baseless PS4s. Yeah. Just get a custom made, just an acrylic piece. Maybe VGA will make you an acrylic piece and just yeah. put it on top. <laughs> hey, I, I am a VGA custom acrylic customer um, from long before my Blada days for uh, a very specific boxed edition of the Game Boy Advance Micro, uh, Final Fantasy IV edition to be particular, um, the Japanese console. Um, they made me a really excellent box, so great work. Over well, there, when guys. You, when you need those weird sizes, I mean, they're the oh, yeah. only option. There the is. only option, and That's it really crazy. is like all things considered. I mean, I bought this probably, I don't know, seven eight years ago at this point, but it but it was very economical for what it was. And Josh, I think you're muted. Sorry, I no, I, I my kid came in the room. I about you guys? How about wins? Yeah, Josh, what do you got for win? I got a couple things. Hold on real quick. Yeah, kiddo. I can do my wins. That's okay. All right. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, go for it. Josh. Dogs went outside. Um, I got them right here. Picked up a steelbook version of Mario Brothers movie. And I'm actually going to send this one in. I want to grade them. I got these nice. at Walmart. And um, just the Ultra 4K. I don't think that it might be a steelbook. Sonic, it's in a sleeve, but it looks like a mm. steel book under there. So, Sonic the Hedgehog 2. And then a um, standard DVD of uh, Pokemon. I was going to grade these. I bought them at the store. Figured I'd try it. I haven't graded any DVDs yet with you guys, so... Yeah, uh, you should give it a shot. Out. Yeah. Um, Pokemon has been incredibly popular when it comes to DVD. I can imagine. And uh, I, I got a couple other things from a buddy. Um... This Nestle Crunch Hot Shots Camp Press Kit with Shaq on it. You might know about this, Claire, but it is an Xbox um, NBA Inside Drive um, press kit. So uh, Shaq was on the cover of NBA Inside Drive 2004, and this has it's a, just a press kit for the game and Nestle Crunch. It's kind of a weird thing. Uh, also got a Madden 09 Brett Favre. New York Jets jersey nice edition. So as you can see, and it's the actual rigid non-printed. Nice, not the printed. So, yeah. So this is the official one. They were sent to GameStops. And as you can see, here's when he was um, with this other stupid Midwest team. So uh, and it has, um, I think, the receipt inside. It's a pretty cool item. So didn't have that for 360. I have a PS2 one. And then uh, this was an interesting thing. It's a sealed copy of Halo Reach bestseller, but it has this really interesting donated by Microsoft sticker on the top. So Interesting. You ever seen something like that, Matt? Claire? So, I, I have not. I've never seen that sticker before. Yeah. So just kind of weird things, but cool things. Unless, so... I got a lot of other shit, but those were kind of the top of them. 
I got now. What about some, you? I got some random stuff too, like stuff I wouldn't normally. <clears throat> Eric linked me over to this. I thought this was cool. Uh, it was just one. Of oh the... yeah, I saw that. Uh, I I totally buy shit like that too, Matt. Yeah, I figured this is up Josh's alley. Maybe this is his Christmas present. Who knows? Yeah, I have I have a bunch of um, pre-order stuff like that. I love it when it's sealed. I love the Xbox stuff yeah. that is press kit and it has COAs on it. It's really cool. And since we're talking about press kits and release kits and stuff, the the price I just couldn't pass up. Uh, it was literally thirty bucks. I forget what the shipping wow. was. Um, normally these are about a hundred bucks. Uh, it doesn't have the inserts in it. Those are impossible to get. Uh, I've been trying to build those over years, and they're just tough to fill in. Okay. Uh, and then in the wild, um, which was fun, I I have twenty eight or twenty nine ROMs for my uh, Play Choice Ten, and I picked up three more in the wild. Um, one was Rygar. Uh, one was Wild Gunman, and then the other was Metroid. So I crossed three more off my list. Uh, so yeah, awesome. Fun stuff. Any anything else uh, comes to mind? I, I we appreciate your time, Claire. Uh, definitely for coming on the show. I didn't want to run this too long. Um, we, I mean, we could literally talk video games all night. I know, but yeah, uh, yeah, we we could talk video games or probably grading until the sun comes up again. Yeah, we really didn't touch much on water stuff, but you know, yeah, and any any burning couple... questions before yeah. we head out about I, water related? I have right now, but um, I guess what is the coolest thing that you have graded? Oh, personally, or e that you've ever? seen? Yeah, ever. Yeah, let's go ever. Ooh, I've got a couple different answers to this. Okay. Um, Top. The coolest Top. thing I've ever seen um, that we were not able to grade um, was the the unreleased Napoleon um, for NES that Ooh, came that with like Napoleon? all, yeah. it, it was the most incredible package of, of assets ever um, from mock-up manuals and film strips and just just so much material about a game that that never service uh, surface, um, and and it worked. You know the the cart was or the ROM was playable, um, so that was like probably one of the coolest things I've ever seen um, come through our doors. Unfortunately, we weren't weren't able to grade it, um, but um, I think probably one of the I'm a very sentimental person, um, and and so um, I mentioned this and. In one of our um, published AMAs recently, but um, we recently got an item um, where uh, it, was a, it was a guy who's getting a Christmas gift for his brother, uh, and it, the game had some writing on the card. Super Nintendo, uh, I think Super Star Wars, um, and it had some writing on the back of the cart. Uh, you know, very common somebody's name or family name or phone number stuff like that. We see it all the time, and and you know, if requested, we'll we'll clean it off. Um, but in this case, he he very specifically said, please do not clean it off um, because um, this writing is some of the only handwriting we have of my very recently departed mother. And so it was their family's name written on the back of this cart. And he said, I'm encapsulating it um, to give it to my brother. So please don't clean it off. Wow. So we were more than happy to do that. And we actually made a, a special notation on the front of the label um, featuring his mother's full name and, um, you know, kind of paying tribute how we can. Because, you know, if, so, if somebody's willing to utilize our services for something, you know, that thoughtful and that sentimental, then, you know, we want to do what we can to um, to make it, you know, special to them as well. Yeah. That's wow. awesome, actually. I think that that's, I'm glad you you guys are all still doing that. I, I know that that was kind of Dennis's thing when, when he was doing stuff there. So it's it, from the get go, it was like just, you know, going a step above and beyond for people and, and making sure that their cherished items were, were cared for properly. So that was like a big part of the water mission when it was founded. So, yeah, I, I love that. That's a, that's a great story. I love that. That's yeah. yeah. He ended up sending actually a few more carts a couple months later. I assume for himself. 
this time around and we were able to add the same details. So um, Very cool. I, I'm glad. I hope it made an impact. Yeah, yeah that's nice. That's awesome. Written, written history is important. So yeah, it definitely is. Uh, so what, one of the final questions I would, I would say is <clears throat> I like to ask this of all, especially all our first time guests. Okay. House is burning down. God forbid that ever happened. Apartment, we whatever. What we know what it is, Matt. You can only grab one thing video game related out of your whole collection, your whole love. What is it? That's a good question. Um, we, we've already seen it, right? I, I, I was mean, thinking, that, I think it would be very high up there. Uh, I think I do have, uh, it's a hard choice. Um, you know, I can, I can make the financial decision and, and take, um, a binder that has like several hundred cartridges in it, which is definitely worth more, um, than other, if I, if I needed to grab one item to have the most value, that would probably be it. Um, but from an emotional perspective, there's no way that's what I would choose. Um, if it's not the item I, I showed just a minute ago, um, I think it would probably be. Um, Game Boy Advance is like my, that's like my console. Like um, it's, it's the one that I spent so much time with and, and like really resonate with the style and the aesthetics and um, even the marketing, like that, that console was just everything to me back in the day. Um, and, and the games have held up so well. I mean, it's the same principles as Super Nintendo. It's basically what it is, but um, I have a, a prototype Game Boy Advance cartridge um, which is, is really special to me. It, it was actually passed down through my family. Um, my uncle is a game developer who's been in the industry for more than 25 years. Um, oh. and, and he was given this prototype at E3 um, by, at the time, a, a Konami employee. Um, and so that is something that I, that I probably have the most, um, you know, it's definitely the most irreplaceable of the things that I have. Wow. What, what game? Uh, can I grab it? Yeah, go absolutely. Um, so the game is Boktai. You can read the oh. label there. Um, yeah. so Boktai, uh, it's a very unique game. It's one of the the few Game Boy again advanced games with a elongated cartridge. Um, and, you know, wh whether it's like Drill Dozer because it's got a, a vibrating motor or, um, you know, not on Game Boy Advance, but one of the pinball games or a fishing game. Um, but for this game, it was for a solar sensor or a light sensor, more simply, um, where um, so this game was was um, I don't know if it was directed or produced or maybe both, um, but by Hide Hideo Kojima, which um, kind of very oddball game for him to have had so much involvement with, um, especially at this point in his career. Like this is in like, this would have been between like Metal Gear, Metal Gear Solid 3 and 4, I think. So like for him to take a, a big break and and spend some time on what was basically a, a kid's RPG um, was, was pretty cool. But um, so that's why the the PCB is sticking out so far. And you can you can actually see the sensor on the the um, right here, that that little part sticking out, and so the, it was an in-game mechanic where um, you needed to play outside in order to recharge um, an element of the main character in order to like stay powerful and defeat enemies. Um, it's a neat game. Yeah, it, it's it's good. It's it, it's like legitimately a good game. Um, mm -hmm. CIBs are are pretty expensive. Sealed copies are not common. I, I don't think we've seen. No. I'd be shocked if we'd seen 20 at WADA. Yeah. Um, but yeah, th this is definitely an item that um, I remember being, you know, I don't know, 15 years old. I guess going back to that, that age where collecting started seeming important to me, really not just important, but viable. Um, and this, my uncle had had this on his, on his desk for a long time. And um I was like, hey, can I have it? Or like, if I can't have it, can I buy it? Or can I do something to earn this from you? And, and he was gracious enough to to give that to me. So, uh, wow. and it does have like a, a playable build. Um, it's got actually still has uh, developer save data on it from, you know, whatever testing they were doing. 
Um, and it's it's a non-final build as well. Oh. So I was actually several years ago now able to connect with uh, a bunch of really hardcore fans of Boktai um, and dump the, the cart for them. Um, and we, we were able to talk about the data together and the differences um, from the retail version. And, you know, it was cool to be able to share it with you know, a small community, but a community that really, really cared about it. That's awesome. That's Game Boy Advance cartridge prototypes are pretty tough to find. Yeah. I know that. So. Well, thanks for sharing that. I mean, that's, I, I think that's what you're grabbing, by the way. Yeah, I you think so too. Arms. You can put the binder under one and, you know. Yeah, that's yeah. fair. <laughs> Get going. Just glue them together so they never are. Yeah, fun. that's true. If I glue together every item, yeah. I would lose nothing, theoretically. <laughs> <laughs> Just glue it. <laughs> yeah. Claire, thank you for coming on today. Uh, I don't have any more questions today. I think it would be cool to have you back on. And then yeah, next yeah I'd be happy so, to. It would be really great. Um, and yeah. If you need to grade your games, get them preserved for all time and eternity. Send them to Wada Games. Claire will handle them. So we'll maybe. do our best. Um, thank you for the shout out. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah. Um, um, you guys, I am uh, at Collect Claire on Instagram. Uh, my DMs are always open. I, I do get a, a lot of DMs on Facebook, Instagram, wherever about Wada specific issues, whether um, you know, whether it's more, you know, typical customer service issues, but um, occasionally I do get uh, good questions about either like our grading philosophy or something about our standards or something that, um, that, that I can answer publicly that, you know, somebody would find useful. So uh, my DMs are always open. Uh, I'll give you as much info as I can. Okay. Great. Awesome. And That's you got to do, you could, I, I just want to say, um, maybe it's not verbalized enough because there's so much hate out there, but you guys do an amazing job. Uh, you always have, obviously, you know, <laughs> most of my games, if not all of them are through you guys. Uh, I trust you guys and I appreciate uh, all the hard work and everything you guys do. So thank you. I appreciate it. Well, thank yeah. you. Um, that actually, I, I really appreciate that. And, and that resonates a lot. You know, I had a good conversation with one of our grading leads recently. And, you know, when it comes to the feedback, a grading and an authentication company is going to get, you don't get credit for um, what you do right, right? Because that's the expectation. Yeah. And I'm not asking for that credit here. Um, but but I do think that's important to keep in mind that, um, you know, if you're only hearing about the squeaky wheels and if those are few and far between, then then you're probably doing a pretty good job. Um, yeah. And so, um, you know, we're always open to feedback. We're, we're not perfect, but we do strive for it. So um, yeah. we, we hold ourselves to very, very high standards, um, higher than people on the outside will ever know or see. Um, but we hope that that comes through in the end product and, um, help people know that, you know, we, we do really care about, uh, every, every game we touch or every media item. Yeah. Your, your consistency, uh, especially over the last year and, and whatnot has been incredible, like spot on. Uh, it's so, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you because I know, you know, there's there's a lot of the other, but not enough of, you know, the good and the thank you. So just want to throw that out there. And if anybody in the comments wants to throw in some thank yous as well, you know, thank Clara and thank the whole WADA team, honestly, um, for all the hard work they've done and, and what they've spurred on and collecting uh, in That's a right. positive manner. So hate mail can go to Josh, though. So Hate mail comes here because I will eat it up and spit it out. So, <laughs> all right. Thanks again for watching. Uh, any thoughts, comments, uh, especially for Claire, you can reach out to Claire on Instagram. Um, and uh, we'll leave we'll leave your Instagram down below as well uh, so people can reach out if they, they have any questions. Uh, leave your thoughts and comments below. Uh, we love and appreciate you all. Thank you again. Thank you again, Claire, for coming on. Uh, and we look forward to having you again. Uh, of course. Thank you, guys. Have a yeah. good one, everybody. We'll Thanks. talk to you guys again soon. Take care.